Hey, it's me. If you're listening to this, you're walking a spiritual path. And know as you walk along that path that you are part of a much bigger community here on earth, a community that I see growing. And know too, there is a much larger community in the spirit world that's connected to it. The spiritual organization is helping and guiding you, making decisions that affect you in ways that you might not even realize. It's no accident that you are part of this community. And I see and I get that sometimes this path can be hard. People around you aren't necessarily supportive of the path you've chosen. Some, in fact, can be downright mean or abusive about it. Until what I'm going to call the core members, okay? So until the core members who've been actively building this community become more aware of their own weaknesses, having people come in who maybe can't fully appreciate the spiritual connection as of yet serves as a kind of test for us. What I mean by that is every challenge we face comes from our own imperfections and it's meant to help us learn and become more aware of where we can improve. So those of us that are in this, that have made this choice, we have a responsibility. There is strength required. The strength comes from all kinds of experiences, even small ones that may seem unimportant or random. When you walk this path with open eyes, you'll notice and learn from everything that happens to you each day, increasing your self-knowledge. As you grow stronger, both spiritually and emotionally, not only will your personal conflicts lessen, but this, the character and spiritual growth of the people joining you along this path will also improve. The people who come to you, let's say early on, aren't guided to you randomly. And I think that's important to, to remember as well. They might have certain merits, maybe from past lives, from this life, that mean they deserve special help and guidance to grow spiritually faster. And it's always up to their own free will, whether they accept that help or not. But at the very least, they should be given that chance. If they take it, it's a big win for them and for all of us, for the spiritual world as a whole. If they don't, their rejection still serves a purpose. Maybe it provides necessary challenges and learning opportunities for the, the rest of us. So maybe you think you're listening to this right now by chance, maybe just out of curiosity, but there's so much more to it than that. And it's not to say that this podcast is anything special. There's a spiritual organization that oversees all of this, though. So much care and effort goes into even the smallest details. It's kind of like doing complex bookkeeping where every detail has to be meticulously considered. And it's all happening behind the scenes for you. People often don't see beyond what's right in front of them. You might not even realize that sometimes hearing a truth too soon can be more harmful than hearing it later. On the other hand, it might be crucial for some people to hear a specific truth or spiritual law at just the right moment. In those cases, the information has to be shared in a way that those who aren't ready won't fully understand it yet. Okay, so there's a lot of organization going on behind the scenes. This organization is deeply involved in many details you might not even notice. But know that it's working with love, care, and wisdom to guide everything for the best outcome for everyone involved, including those who may not have met with you yet, but who will decide to walk alongside you in the future. The messages that I share with you, I trust that they're divinely guided. I mean, I try to be in an authentic, genuine space when I am writing these messages down. I'm just a humble human trying to walk this path myself, though, walking alongside you, seeking to make sense of things, seeking to understand my true self better with the intent to max out my own authenticity, to step into my higher self. 
So the messages are reflective of my own understanding and the sequence to which I have been exposed to these teachings. My guess is there are certain topics or teachings that need to come first, that needed to come first, that later teachings wouldn't have made sense if we didn't have these initial teachings understood first, like that foundation set out first, similar to how we learn and grow in school, right? My sense with all of this is that it's important to not to try to absorb teaching, spiritual teachings with just our intellect. That's not going to get us very far. Instead, you know, try to listen with your heart, your soul, your deepest senses, so you can feel the truth rather than just get it at an intellectual level. That's how you'll gain real understanding. And who knows, maybe it even plants seeds for future enlightenment by doing that. I often feel like words don't suffice. Like God is so great that words really can't describe him. For us humans, it's impossible to fully sense or know what God is. I want to say what I've come to understand is that God is both a person and a principle. So what do I mean by that? Well, people have debated whether God is a person or a force or a principle. And I think all of those views are true. God is the creator, and as such, is a person. Okay? So, God makes decisions and sets things in motion. As the creator and a person, God created the universe with all its laws, as well as other beings, although the creation of these beings was in partnership with uh, the divine feminine. Right? So, the divine masculine was kind of like their creation in partnership with the divine feminine. So when it said that God created us in his image, it means that all divine qualities are present in us to some degree. So the ability to create exists in each and every one of us. The ability to create exists in you. You are a creator. This divine substance that God has to the fullest degree and that Christ had maybe is best described as a radiant fluid substance, life force. It's the life force. God and all beings in their highest form can dissolve the substance so that their individual personalities become more like a flow or a divine stream in a sense. It doesn't mean that they stop being individuals who can think and make decisions. It's a state of simply being, of slow growth. In organic development. And I think that aspect is what is meant when we talk about the divine feminine, right? So you probably have heard divine feminine and divine masculine. When the divine feminine aspect is more active, we merge with God in a state of being. When the divine masculine aspect is active, we help in creation according to God's will and divine law. Being creating. Both are needed. One cannot exist without the other. They are extensions of each other. I wonder if even the highest spirits can completely grasp God's love, wisdom, and perfection, or the infinite variety of his creation. Perhaps we can only stand in awe and praise. One thing I wonder too is why did God create all these beings on earth? Like being all-knowing, he must have realized that misery and conflict could result, right? I don't know the answer to this question. It's a big question. What I understand is God is love. And love must share. That's the nature of love. Of course, I think of course God knew that by creating beings with free will, they might choose in ways that could bring about misery, either temporarily or permanently. But in his greatness, God created beings who could freely choose how to use the power given to them. They could either have the wisdom not to misuse their power and live in eternal bliss with divine law, or if they chose otherwise, 
they'd eventually come to understand the perfection of divine law, maybe even more so after experiencing hardship. They become more godlike than ever before. The temporary misery for those who might choose that latter path is nothing compared to the eternal happiness they'll experience after going through and learning from their own self-inflicted suffering. What do you think? Like, does that resonate with you? Maybe God created many beings and worlds long before the material world existed. Worlds of harmony, happiness, infinite beauty, and endless possibilities that allowed all beings to express divine qualities. Maybe in these worlds, the divine substance in each being was fully active and not covered up by any ungodlike layers. Maybe our task here on earth is to uncover this divine substance within ourselves and free it from the layers that separate us from ourselves and from God. This divine substance is what we've called higher self or that divine spark. Maybe that's what the Holy Spirit is. Maybe the Holy Spirit isn't one being or even part of a threefold God as it's often interpreted. Maybe the Holy Spirit is simply the divine substance that every living creature has to some degree, whether it's somewhat free from other layers or still covered by them. Okay, so let's say this is true. How then did these foreign layers, so to speak, cover the divine substance each being was originally? And perhaps that's where the story of the fall of the angels comes in. Another name for these pure godlike beings or holy spirits is angels. People often say that God shouldn't have given his creatures free will because then the fall wouldn't have happened. Or they think God should have stepped in when things started to go wrong. But I wonder if those views may be short-sighted. Okay, so consider this. Happiness can only exist for any being through union with God. To be in union with God, you must be of the same substance, have the same qualities, otherwise you'd be unlike God and couldn't unite with him. Free will and the ability to choose include the possibility of using that free will against divine law. Choosing freely and correctly and not misusing power is where divinity, love, wisdom, and all the other divine qualities come in. God set up laws within creation. These laws made it possible from the start for beings to return to God if ever they misused their power and freedom. These laws tend to work in cycles that must be completed. And no matter what happens, these cycles continue, and the laws ensure that eventually everything that has turned away from God and divine law will come back. Now, the further away from God we are, the more miserable we feel, because, again, true happiness is only found in God. But the misery creates a stronger desire to return back, to return back to him. Thinking about this deeply, I think can help us understand many things that might have been hidden from us. Like if we purify our own inner vision and senses enough, we start to recognize this law even in our own daily life, even in small events. Okay, so what if spiritual worlds existed for a very long time where all beings lived in unimaginable bliss? From the beginning, every creature had the choice to live within divine law or to go against it. And at one point, at one point, one spirit was tempted to act against it. You can see a symbolic explanation of the story in the story of Adam and Eve, right? Maybe you can understand this if you imagine having great power, like if you're not familiar with the story of Adam and Eve. So imagine you have this great power. You might know that using this power in certain ways could be dangerous, but as long as you don't misuse it, you're okay. And you might feel curious about what would happen if you did use it. This temptation 
over time grows stronger. And the stronger it gets, the less you think about resisting it. You might not plan to keep using this dangerous power, but you feel like you have to try it just once to see what it's like. All the knowledge you have about the risks fades away under the weight of temptation. Once that first spirit gave in to temptation, it set something in motion that couldn't be changed. The spirit knew what would happen, but didn't want to remember after giving in. The change didn't happen all at once, rather gradually. The shift from harmony to disharmony happened just as slowly as personal growth from disharmony to harmony happens for us. The latter is evolution. The former, we could call it devolution. And neither happens suddenly. Let's use another example here. Suppose you're tempted to try an addictive drug. You don't plan to get hooked. You just want to try it once. But after that one time, you can't escape. You're caught. The same principle applies to anything that goes against divine law. This one spirit who gave in first created a power that moved in the opposite direction of divine law. But it was still the same power, just used differently. With this power, the spirit could gradually influence many other spirits. But not all spirits were affected. There was a division between those who gave in and those who didn't. For those who did, the fall of the angels began. In this process, every divine quality turned into its opposite. Harmony became disharmony. Beauty became ugliness. Light became darkness. Wisdom became ignorance. Love turned into hatred. And unity became separation. As temptation continued, things split even further. And that's how evil came into existence. Spiritual worlds are psychological worlds, but it doesn't mean that they're unsubstantial or formless. Only in our material world are thoughts and feelings abstract. In other worlds, spirits create their own environments based on their state of mind. Each mindset creates, as a reflex almost, a sphere with landscapes, houses, objects, and so on. And I think that's more the state an experience that we're heading to, you know, when people talk about new earth. So this could be why only spirits at the same level of development can share a world. In some stages, this makes life easier, but can also slow down individual growth. So when you realize that your attitude, your thoughts, your feelings, opinions, and goals create your world, you start to understand that the world of the highest spirits is beautiful and full of light, while the world of the fallen spirits has become dark and ugly. Since the great plan was set in motion, many in-between worlds have come into existence with various degrees of harmony and disharmony based on the development level of the spirits. Our material world is thought to be one of these in-between worlds. In their highest state, individual spirits combine both the male and female aspects of divinity, divine feminine and divine masculine. There's no inner division or conflict at that level. The fact that on earth we have men and women as separate entities is a result of that splitting. So each person has a counterpart. The human desire to find the right partner comes from a deep longing to reunite with the separated other half. In some lifetimes, we meet our true counterpart. And through the happiness that brings, we have certain duties to fulfill. In other lifetimes, we might not meet them, and that's meant to fulfill different purposes. Not meeting your true counterpart doesn't mean that you have to live alone, right? You might have other partners with whom you can build great happiness, fulfill other duties, resolve karma, and so on. So just as an aside, if you're in a life without your true counterpart, but have another partner, don't think that your counterpart in the spirit world will be hurt or jealous because of the love you share now. That's not how things work. No matter how you learn, if you learn to give love, you're taking a step closer to God, to your fulfillment, and to your freedom, and also to your counterpart. 
So the desire for this kind of love, including sexual love, is the longing to reunite with your counterpart and become whole again. And that fulfillment depends on how you direct this energy. It's been said that what we look at as these less developed beings, like animals, plants, and minerals, they're still in a state of further division. The human condition being split in half, so to speak, is perhaps the last stage before we can reunite with our original state. The disharmonious worlds that came into existence through separation from God and the fall of the angels are sometimes also referred to as hell. These worlds simply reflect the state of mind of the beings living there. Hell is in just one place. There are many levels, just as there are many levels in the divine world or heaven. When the fall happened, not everyone who participated ended up in the same level of disharmony or evil. The degree varied for each individual, so different spheres came into being within the world of darkness, always matching each being's state of mind. But for our purposes, overall, we're going to say that every divine quality turned into its opposite to some extent. So as long as we haven't completely purified ourselves, some characteristics of the fall are still happening within us to some degree. It would be really helpful for each of us to look deep into our souls and become aware of this process. Like when you think about your personal faults, try to find the original divine quality behind them. No fault exists on its own. It's just a distortion of something that was once divine. You can find this divine aspect in all of your faults. Then it'll be easier to purify those faults and let go of any hopelessness or feelings of inferiority. Now to do this, you first have to recognize your faults and face them bravely. When these unhappy worlds gradually came into being and many beings separated from God, Divine law made it possible for them to regain the happy state they once knew. Certain decisions and changes had to be made, though, always respecting the free will of the fallen spirits, whether individually or as a group. This was also part of God's plan, with the timing left for the right moment. Some say this is all part of the plan of salvation, for which God enlisted the help of all spirits who stayed faithful to him as well as those who reached or are still reaching a sufficient level of development after their fall to help others. Now, what I'm describing is, of course, an incomplete picture, because I don't know. But even with this incomplete picture, my hope is that maybe maybe you'll start to find some of your questions start to be answered. Like, if you take the time to think deeply, meditate, and, and ask God to help you understand. When you gain this understanding, you'll be able to comprehend what life really means, why you're here, and what your personal task is in this life. Because everyone has a purpose. You have a purpose. Those who have peace of mind have found their tasks. If you haven't found this peace yet, this inner sense of peace, maybe you haven't found your place. Your inner self will tell you whether you found your task through the happiness or unrest you feel. And all you have to do is ask. All you have to do is ask yourself. If you still feel uneasy, restless, or lacking peace, ask God to help you find your task and be open to his guidance. What might be standing between you and fully living out your life's purpose could be aspects of your personal growth. Maybe you're blind to some parts of your personality that are blocking you, for example. You don't have to look too far for the answer. I can assure you that right within yourself are all the answers you need. Let me know if that resonated. I love you. Let's connect soon.